yeah, we will have another session. The second session is related to the uh, the com comp composable data for the composition enterprise. Yo, and and then we will have an another session after four minutes. Yeah, around four minutes. Uh, at this moment, at this break, you can go to our uh, Palace Village to take a look for our different proofs and learn more about the API ecosystem. Yeah. Let's come back after four minutes. APIs aren't just about technology. APIs are about culture, they're about people. APIs are enabling a change. Had some fantastic conversations with people. It's, it's been a really great experience. The, the local community is what makes it happen. And everyone is inspired by the talks here. really important uh, our APIs to connect with uh, our older uh, backend systems. It is critical to speak at events like API Days uh, because this is where the professionals around APIs meet. Uh, it's especially important for us because we want to empower development and architects to actually deal with API security and this is where this crowd actually meets. Being able to come here to exchange with other enthusiasts from the community is just excellent. I truly believe that eventually all things digital are going to connect to each other over APIs. Hello, uh, the second sharing in this session is held by Andrew Dan, who is the director of Solution Engineer at MuleSoft. Hello, Andrew. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, how's your day? Oh, it's very good. We're in lockdown here in Sydney, but uh, I was just looking at the uh, picture of the conference in person, so I wish I was there. Yeah, it's a we virtual conference so we can talk more about it and we can enjoy the conference at these two days yeah okay uh the topic that andrew will do is uh compositable data for the compositable enterprise and nickel frying data capital with the apis okay andrew it's your time right now thank you very much eric my name is Andrew Dent. I'm Mulesoft CTO for the Asia Pacific region. And, and hello to everybody today. I hope uh, you're faring well in these uh, tough times. As Eric mentioned, uh, the title of my presentation is Composable Data for the Composable Enterprise. I think it's a, it's a very fancy title for my presentation today. But what I wanted to talk about is actually very simple. I wanted to talk about how we value data, how we unlock that value, and how APIs can help you do that. I think at MuleSoft, we're very qualified to talk about this. We're the market leader in API management. We're the market leader in IPaaS and general integration. And increasingly, we're looking at the data space. So this is an area of a lot of interest for us. I'm a long time subscriber to The Economist. As I mentioned, I'm in lockdown now. So one of the highlights of my week is going up to my mailbox and taking a look at The New Economist when it comes out. My favorite thing is to look at the cover. And this is one of my favorite uh, covers. It's a couple of years back. 
Um, but the cover really paints a picture of an analogy of data as the new oil, as a raw material that's extracted and exploited by the digital powerhouses of our age. We're all trying to get access to this new oil. Some companies, such as those in, that were talked about in that Economist article, are very good with data. But many of us have got a long way to go. Many of us work for companies and on systems that were invented long before tracking every bit of data was a thing. Many of our systems and processes are fundamentally transactional and they don't have instrumentation and the reporting systems on them are super basic. And so, I mean, I'd say in general, data is still pretty poorly understood and managed. Often I'll get asked to come and talk to a chief data op officer in a, in a company to really talk through how we can help. And to be very honest, traditionally those conversations haven't been super interesting because you know, Mule is very much in the API management business and hasn't traditionally focused on the data management business. But I'd say over the, you know, the last year or so, those conversations, the nature of those conversations have really changed and become a lot more interesting. Why? Well, the driver in the data movement has moved from business intelligence to one of data science. And if we think about pushing up personalization, if we think about digital transformation initiatives, then it's very critical uh, that we have APIs to help in this regard. So how do we support this digital transformation? Well, some of the things that we need to do is we need to cut across different data sources. We need to incorporate data from external systems and we need to incorporate real-time delivery. If I could say that, in other words, data needs to be more timely and more mobile. And this is, and these factors are increasing the importance of APIs and integration. Over the last number of years, I think we've come a long way to changing the way we think about data and how we value data. And if you'll humor me and, and, and allow me to continue my economist oil analogy, perhaps we're in the, the kerosene phase, a time in history where people figured out that oil was actually a great application for lighting applications, where traditionally whale oil had been used. And so we're still a far way off from that sophisticated ecosystem that really surrounds oil's usage in the modern society. And I think really part of the problem is that we still view data as very much a raw material and not as a refined component of something larger. What really needs to happen for us to industrialize the use of data is not a technology shift, it's a mind shift. We really start to need to look at data through a product lens. If we could consider data as a capital input that we use to produce our product. I mean, think about it today. A lot of data is generated in large organizations at a departmental level and used by that department. The usage of that data for other areas in the organization is generally not considered. Contrast that with maybe the production of a physical good like a car. Every component of the car is physically engineered to produce that final product. I think another aspect that's important to consider here is to date, many companies have focused on the technical capabilities of data management. And these technical capabilities are controlled typically by the IT function. And so to a large extent, we've been a lot more focused on infrastructure and a lot less focused on the end product that's being produced. And so what I argue in this presentation really is when we're thinking about data, we, th we need to think more about the outputs of what we're producing. We need to be thinking about data products. And these data products, they help us make decisions. 
They differentiate our products and services and they help to satisfy our customers. When I think about data collection in economic terms, it has a very high upfront cost for me to collect data, but a very low marginal cost as I start to continue to collect those, those data. And it's these huge upfront costs that can prevent a lot of firms from collecting data or try and get them to make a business case or a financial return on that data. And that can be a real barrier to getting the value from data. So we should always start with that end product in mind to help us drive the business case for data collection. It's always a bit difficult for, for folks, especially IT folks, to see data in this way. So how do we start this mind shift? Well, I think one of the things that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to talk, we're going to need to talk about data not in technical terms, but in economic and product terms. And so what I would say if I was speaking in those terms, I would say data is non-rivable. It's non-fungible. It's an experience good whose value increases in a non-linear way as it's collected and correlated. Now, if I were to go into a product management meeting and talk like that, they would think I was completely crazy uh, because, and I think if you don't really understand this sentence, I guess I've made my point, right? So let's do, spend a little time here just doing a little, little English translation from our economics. Non-rival, consider a birthday score like the Happy Birthday song. It's on sheet music. It can be reused over again. Data is reusable as opposed to something like a birthday cake where once I consume it, its value is, is exhausted. Non-fungibility is really this notion around swappability. And so an airline ticket is non-fungible. It's not interchangeable with another ticket because it has my name on it and it has a particular date on it. Whereas a dollar bill is a dollar bill is a dollar bill. Any dollar bill will do. Data is non-fungible. Data is also an experience good. An experience good is something that I need to consume first before I understand its value. Traditionally in economics, a restaurant has been the example used as an experience good. But increasingly now with the internet, I can do a search and understand what my experience is going to be at a restaurant through a review. So it's an interesting example of how the internet is changing some economic theory. And our final piece is data is nonlinear. And what we mean by nonlinear is if I take one piece of data and another piece of data and combine them together, the sum is more than the parts in terms of the value. Okay? So we've done that translation. So let's rewrite our sentence now. So the sentence is now data can be reused and each piece of data is unique. We gain insight through the analysis of that data. And when the data is correlated with other data, it's got the potential to increase in value exponentially. So that's a, that's a much nicer way to, way to talk, about, uh, talk about data. So I think, you know, this encapsulates the value of data, but in order to mine this value, there's some risks associated with the mining process. So let's look at them quickly now. The fact that data is reusable and I can photocopy it and use it over and over is great. But the risk I have is data leakage. If that data gets out of my organization, perhaps to a competitor, or maybe to a, to a bad actor, I have a big reputational risk that I might suffer. Each piece of data is unique in the world. And this is fantastic because it, each piece of data has the potential to give me a new insight. The problem with that is if I treat each piece of data as unique, I've got a huge management overhead. It's a great example I like to, to use. There was a company in Florida that manage poles and wires and unfortunately one of their poles fell down and killed somebody and so they were responsible they had to make a big payout unfortunately for the company they hadn't classified their poles right 
And so it turns out that they didn't actually own that poll. It was managed by another party. And so this management overhead is what data do I manage? What data do I do I not manage? Data can bring us wonderful insights, but which data provides which insights is another aspect that we that 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 can create some risks for us. I think maybe we've all been in a project where a business user has plonked a data set in front of us and said, well, here, go figure out where the data in this data set is. It's very difficult to do that. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And so the point that's sort of emerging here is if we start to use this product lens to filter back through to data value and to the risks associated with data, it helps us build these data products. The final aspect we need to consider is the correlation of data or the adding of data together to drive up the value. This is very powerful, but when we do this, we expose ourselves to the compromising of privacy. I think the Cambridge Analytics issue with Facebook is a great example of that. And we've seen the emergence of a lot of laws in the EU, which are trying to minimize this combination of data which can compromise people's privacy. So we know how to, we understand the value and we understand the risks. And so what we've come up with is a simple framework um, for, for, for using data. And we call it share it, use it and protect it. Okay. And so when I share the data, I want to make it freely available in real time within my enterprise. We need to share all of it because we're not sure of which piece might yield the right insight. We need to use this data. Now that the data is flowing in the enterprise, I need to mix it up to create the value because that's where I'm going to get the exponential returns. And finally, we need to protect the data. I can't just share it willy nilly outside my organization as this has privacy implications and data linkage can cause great problems with me. So now I have my mantra, share it, use it, protect it. But how would I implement something like this? At MuleSoft, we're focused on API-led connectivity, on the building of reusable assets in order to be able to drive an organization's digital transformation. And our data architecture is very much modeled in this vein. If you look at the bottom level, we have effectively what I'll call the crude oil of the data supply chain. In this model, components are built as basically raw elements. And these components are refined to use common schemas and taxonomies. There's also a security layer at the com component data layer, and this prevents data leakage to higher levels. These crude or, or component data pieces are then surfaced to the composite data layer. Now, these composite data are basically complex products used by combining the crude assets together. They're bespoke data products that are created to a specification as defined by a product group. Now, another really important attribute of this, this composite data layer is that it's reusable. It can be incorporated in multiple finished goods. Think about an alternator that's maybe built by a car company such as Toyota. They'll build an alternator and that can be used in multiple models of cars. Employee data is another great example. Employee data is made up from multiple crude components within the enterprise. It can be published as a composite data element, and then it can be leveraged by multiple application systems on the end. And this brings us to the contextualized data layer. And let's look at that layer in a bit more detail. The contextualized data layer is effectively our finished good. It's the point of consumption of data. I just wanted to introduce one concept here, one more theoretical concept, which is liquidity. Now, no value 
of an asset exists unless I have the ability to quickly deploy that asset. Obviously, in finance, cash is the ultimate liquid asset. And for data to be, for data value to be realized, it must be very liquid, right? And so for us, what that means is the right data in the right context at the right time. So I think the best way that this is illustrated is through an example of, say, an insurance renewal. Now, let's say my insurance premium is about to come up. If a competitive insurer is able to send me a targeted offer of a discount on my insurance at that exact point in my, my renewal with my existing provider, that's a very liquid data experience that I've had. It's the right data in the right context at the right time. So let's now move to a real world example um, that embodies many of the principles that we've discussed today. When COVID-19 and the pandemic first formed, we formed a tiger team between Salesforce, Tableau and MuleSoft. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to really see how data could help people deal with and recover from the crisis. So, so to start with, we focused on that, you know, on the product piece of the equation, right? What data is in demand? And that was really case information in terms of new infections, hospitalizations, fatalities, and policy information in terms of what governments, both national, regional, and corporations were doing. And so what we did is we looked for those openly available crude data sources and we created common wrappers around that. So we normalized these formats. Some of them were CSVs, some of them were web pages, some of them were databases, but we made this basically component data layer, okay? And then all that data was published into a data warehouse which Tableau used to visualize analytics on that data. But to get the most value out of that data, we needed to integrate it into products, into the user-facing products, okay? So we created a number of composite APIs which served up core data into three applications which consumed that composite data via, uh, via contextualized APIs. One was a public interface for Tableau such that users could go to Tableau and view the composite APIs. Another was a policy-focused API for salesforcework.com, which enabled corporations to get their employees back to work. And then the final API was a RESTful API for partners to be able to access the raw data. So this is kind of a real-world example of how I can take the raw data on one end, I'll have the products on the one end and build this supply chain of data value. So that's really all I had to talk to you about today. I wanted to leave you with these three points. Think more about data as a capital asset and have that product mindset. Use data, share data, but also remember to protect it and always be thinking about data liquidity. How do I provide the right data at the right context in the right time? Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions if we've got any time. Hello, Andrew. Yeah, you told us that uh, the data is a part of product. Um, is it equivalent to the data as a service which provide the data or insights uh, to customer yeah i th i think data in its raw format can be da data as a service but you know when i talk about that i think that's very unrefined data as the final product is really about an experience remember that example i told you about insurance where i had absolute delight that an insurer was able to give me the right product the right data in the right context at the right time. That is ultimately the product. And so I think we need to change our mindset from data is something I download to a spreadsheet 
to be something that creates an experience for a customer. Mm. We all know that uh, the data is extremely important assets for a company. Um, do you have any suggestion to a company to maximize their data's value and how to start it from small with MuleSoft? Yeah, look, I'm, I mean, I think that one of the things that we always focus on at MuleSoft is start with the business problem. Don't start with the integration, okay? And so when we talk to customers, what are you trying to achieve from a product project perspective? And then we'll talk about the integration as how it can enable and, and enrich that pro project. And we need to bring that exact same mentality to data. Don't be thinking about data for data's sake. Be thinking about wonderful experiences and then think backwards from there in terms of what data do I need to make that happen. And that will help value the data. It will provide a business case for collecting the data. It will provide the business case for refining the data to the format that you need. Okay. Um, the last question, yeah. Uh, is there any um, common telco or business obstacle to build the contextualized data uh, that we should take care during the architectural design phases, let's say the security and so on? Yeah, look, I, I mean, obviously, um, security is a, it, it, it is a big issue. And that's why a data architecture is very important for that, is that at your lower levels, your unrefined data levels, you're providing security and governance such that application developers who are working at the contextualized data level have are working on data sets that have been governed by corporate governance rules. So, for example, for non-payment non data, we might want to mask out all credit card information. For, for consumers at the contextualized level that are using um, data to do statistics, we can anonymize the data. So I think there's a whole service in that protected component which helps to reduce the barriers for developing at the contextualized layer. Okay, I think the time is almost up for this session. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for your time to share, to do more. Thank you very much for sharing to us. Thank you very yeah. much for I everybody. It's been wonderful yeah, I hope to that be all with you. Of us, yeah, I hope that all of us can learn something from you. Yeah.